Hello everyone. So this is the first uh, lesson of the uh, course maintenance of mechatronic systems ETME 3120. So uh, first, let's start with uh, an introduction of uh, maintenance management. So there are actually two uh, main reasons for having a, a maintenance management system. So the first one, of course, is to increase the uptime of an equipment or of the equipment and reduce the downtime. So you want to increase the time the equipment is operational and reduce the, t the time it is down and operational. Number two, of course, is to make the most efficient and most effective use of the facilities that you have. So let's define maintenance. So it's basically all the activities necessary to keep a system and all of its components in working order. That is to maintain the capability of the system while controlling the costs. Failure is any deviation or change in the production system from its satisfactory condition to a condition below acceptable or operating uh, standards. So uh, basically the components of the cost uh, that you that uh, that you will in, in, uh, have basically are uh, the maintenance labor and materials and the production losses now before we proceed let's just uh, have a uh, let's look at the history and evolution of manufacturing since actually maintenance uh, most of you will be actually going through uh, the manufacturing industry so let's look at uh, an evo the, the historical evolution of uh, manufacturing, or let's say the manufacturing paradigms. So uh, <clears throat> uh, lean manufacturing, you have all probably heard of that, lean manufacturing in the 1940s. It was initiated in Japan, and it's still actually very effectively used until today. Uh, basically, uh, its main feature is waste management. Now, uh, some features, uh, let's say some, some uh, aspects of lean manufacturing include uh, things that are really simple, but at the same time very effective and can be implemented everywhere in the, uh, in the plant, from the operator level all the way to the CEO level. Like, for example, 5S, uh, for instance, or the 7 Wastes and uh, so on so it's, it's uh, simple things that can be implemented everywhere and uh, can be very effective then after that you might have heard of the uh, terms flexible manufacturing systems computer integrated manufacturing uh, sustainable manufacturing these terms actually uh, came uh, computer integrated manufacturing came in the 1970s and fms in the 1970s basically they uh, came to include uh, after the after the invention of computers uh, basically the computerized manufacturing systems. Then after that, actually, uh, we heard a lot of terms that came over time. Uh, then in the 2000s, cloud manufacturing and smart manufacturing these days, or which corresponds to Industry 4.0. Uh, the main feature, of course, of Industry 4.0 is artificial intelligence. In other words, you'll have, like, for example, uh, uh, smartphones, you have uh, um, image recognition, and a lot of uh, um, uh, technologies that are based on uh, <coughs> uh, intelligent systems. So, uh, uh, actually, also before we proceed, we have to also uh, talk about terms, recently evolving terms, because the book is a little outdated, and so uh, we need to uh, at least I want to make sure that you everyone has an idea of the terms that are that you will hear a lot these days. Industry 4.0. So uh, it's really the main thing, probably the, the key word since 2011. So Industry 4.0, I uh, came to identify the technology and prices of, let's say, the fourth generation of industry. So that means that we had there were three previous generations, and now we are in the fourth generation. So the question is, what are <coughs> what are the previous three generations of industry? Let's look at them here. So the first generation, uh, or let's call it Industry 1.0. So that's that started in the let's say in the in the late Middle Ages, uh, and the start of the Industrial uh, Revolution in the 1700s. That's when they first uh, when when the steam engine was invented. Like for example here, look at this system here. So here we have, it's a complex mechanical system that uh, includes uh, uh, steam driven built drives, for example. This here, this is actually a popular mechanism, it's called the Geneva Mechanism. It's basically a mechanism that was used, and still is used, in, is, is in use today actually, 
uh, it's for indexing tables. So, uh, so let's say uh, the, the main term for uh, for the first generation of industry was mechanization, in which they had advanced mechanical systems. Now let's look at industry 2.0, or the second uh, generation of uh, manufacturing of industry. So this was uh, uh, in the early 1900s until the beginning of the age of computers. Uh, so the word automation, by the way, let's say this is the main word that identifies second generation. The word automation does not necessarily mean that there's a computer. Okay, like, you know, uh, uh, so like, for example, here, this is the first automated uh, uh, assembly line uh, by Ford Motors in 1913. Okay, so uh, that was before the age of computers. Okay, uh, after the 1970s, after the after uh, co uh, computers became uh, widely used, uh, we can call it basically computerization, the computerization age or the computerized automation age. That's when you have industrial robotics and you have uh, programmable logic controllers and computers basically in the control. That was that lasted until the 2010s. After that we have the fourth generation of industry and if there is one word or one phrase that can identify the fourth generation it would be artificial intelligence okay so in other words everything around you is a smart system like for example a smartphone for instance or uh, uh, augmented reality for instance so uh, for example robotics uh, collaborative robots and so on so uh, <laughs> Basically, this is this, are, this is the fourth generation of industry, and these are the f previous three generations. Now let's go back to where we were. So maintenance. Now uh, versus cost. Let's see how effective is maintenance when it comes to uh, cost. So if you don't have a, if you have a system and you don't have any maintenance at all, then the cost is gonna be significant. Okay, so this here. The x axis is the level of maintenance. This is the y axis for the cost. So if you don't have any maintenance at all, then you're going to have significant uh, costs. Now, if you have too many uh, maintenance routines, too many preventive maintenance routines, then you are also going to have too much of a cost. Okay? So you need to determine which level of maintenance do you need of preventive maintenance. How many routines do you need per year? Okay, you want to have something. You want to optimize it somewhere, where uh, you will have a certain number of, of uh, maintenance procedures done per year that will keep the costs at a minimum. And we're gonna see that in chapter two. We're gonna see how to do that in chapter two. In lesson two. Okay, let's look at uh, the main objectives of maintenance. So these are the let's say the the um, the goals that you should expect. If you work in a maintenance department, these are the these are what tasks that you should be expecting to do. Let's start with the primary goals. So the primary goals: uh, maintaining existing equipment. Obviously, as the name suggests, you have to maintain existing equipment. Equipment inspection and lubrication. This is part of the preventive maintenance program. Equipment modification and installation. Sometimes you need to modify or install new equipment. Utility generation, distribution, and management, like for instance, let's say the electric power or uh, the pneumatic power distribution and generation and so on. Maintaining existing building and grounds and building uh, uh, modifications, if there's any uh, modification in the building. Secondary goals, so these are the primary goals. The secondary goals may include, uh, for example, security, providing security and protection to the plant, uh, salvage of obsolete equipment and waste disposal. Uh, pollution, uh, pollution and noise control, uh, and also uh, compliance with certain uh, bodies, like for example, uh, for instance, uh, yeah, the ADA, the EPA, the OSHA. Uh, so here we have so uh, ED, uh, OSHA, of course, is the occupational uh, uh, safety and health uh, uh, body, and also we have the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. And uh, this, the ADA is for, uh, basically for facilities, for uh, um, disabilities. So uh, the act for, for, for disabled persons. Uh, other functions also may be uh, included in the secondary uh, goals. 
Now, uh, let's look at these, the typical job duties of a level 1 technician. Actually, these, I collected them, I personally collected them, uh, based on years of experience in teaching uh, mechatronics. So, uh, these are what you should be expecting to get a few start as a level 1 technician. So, uh, reading schematics. This is a very, very important thing and very critical. You need to be able to read uh, schematic diagrams like electrical, hydraulic, and pneumatic uh, schematic diagrams, uh, wiring diagrams, and uh, machine drawings. Electrical measurements, uh, particularly the uh, multimeter. You need to be able to use the multimeter, whether you're reading the amps or the volts or the ohms, to do certain to to so that you can use the readings to troubleshoot uh, and uh, analyze equipment. Mechanical measurements like using the calipers, scales, tachometers, and levels, and different uh, mechanical equipment and instruments. Simple mathematics. So uh, you don't need really to work in maintenance. You don't need, let's say, calculus level uh, mathematics, but you need to be able to do, for example, uh, algebra. You need to be able to find uh, areas uh, of different shapes, uh, circumferences. Uh, you need to be able to do fractions and decimals and so on. Uh, units. Some of the units are very important. Some of them are metric and some of them are English. Like, for example, uh, the kilowatts, you know, the kilowatts and the horsepower, how to convert from kilowatts to horsepower and back and forth. Uh, for example, the kilowatt hour. What is the kilowatt hour unit used for? Uh, <clears throat> others, like, for example, you know, uh, feet, meters, uh, pounds, and kilograms, and different uh, units that are commonly used. Operating AC and DC motors, <coughs> very important to operate, to be able to know how to operate AC, both AC and DC motors. Of course, most motors that you'll encounter will be AC, let's say induction motors, uh, particularly three-phase, but you will also encounter different uh, uh, DC uh, machines, you will also encounter different, let's say, special purpose uh, uh, motors, like, for example, a brushless motor or a stepper motor and uh, different types of uh, machines. Alignment techniques. So uh, to do alignment, like for example, to use the straight edge, or for example, correcting for the soft foot for, for machines uh, to reduce vibration and so on. Lubrication, very important. Bearing lubrication, chain lubrication, and so on. Uh, mechanical systems, like for instance, the ratios for the gear ratios, uh, chain uh, drives, the, the ratios for chain drives, built drives, pulley systems, uh, very important actually to, to know all these. Maintenance of bearings and uh, gear drives, operating and maintaining hydraulic and pneumatic uh, systems, and of course to do predictive and preventive maintenance uh, procedures. So uh, these really, uh, uh, most if you work in, uh, like I said, as a technician, you will most likely end up doing these uh, uh, tasks, these job duties here. Okay. Management and structure of maintenance. So, uh, the, let's say on the managerial level of maintenance, there are two functions, planning and scheduling. Planning basically means uh, the activities, you prioritize the activities, uh, estimating time required for maintenance, uh, the type of equipment, the labor and estimating the uh, the time uh, for labor, the labor size and so on, and uh, measure the performance. Uh, planning is executing these. Uh, I'm sorry. Scheduling is executing the uh, the plans that I just mentioned. A term that you should know also is backlog. So the backlog is the accumulation of un uncompleted maintenance work. So uh, let's say. A healthy backlog should be in the range two to three weeks in let's say in a in a typical plant now if you have uh, a smaller backlog if you have for example a few days of backlog that's not going to be efficient because that means you're gonna you're, you're paying a lot of money for uh, uh, for labor and the uh, and the, the workforces are not doing anything or uh, not very effectively making use of them uh, also you should not have too much of a backlog. You cannot, I mean, like, for example, six or seven weeks backlog, that's too long of a time of downtime because uh, the equipment would be, you know, uh, not operational until seven weeks, uh, you know, uh, six or seven weeks. So uh, the downtime is going to be too long and again, it's going to be inefficient. So the healthy 
range should be in the range two to three weeks. If the backlog is continuously decreasing, if you have a trend of a decreasing backlog, then uh, the answer for that is most likely going to be to downsize the uh, workforce, to downsize the maintenance workforce to keep uh, to the efficiency level uh, steady. If the backlog has a trend of increasing, then most likely you will need to hire more of the maintenance workforce or you probably uh, contract with more uh, maintenance uh, uh, workforce or even uh, schedule uh, over time. So uh, let's look at an example of using uh, backlog. And uh, So uh, um, <coughs> the crew size, to determine the crew size, the number of uh, personnel in the, in the maintenance department, you should find, uh, you should get actually the following parameters. So the, uh, the scheduled labor hours per week. So this needs actually a, a history. So you need to have to ac access to the history, uh, historical data. And based on the history, you can estimate the uh, labor hours that are needed, the total number of labor hours needed per week. Uh, the backlog, for example, if you want uh, two or three weeks of backlog, and the hours per week per person. So if each person works, for example, 40 hours per week, well, that's going to be the hours per week. And based on that, we can have uh, we can estimate the crew size that is needed. So let's take this example here. What is the number of technicians needed if the scheduled maintenance work is 1,250 uh, hours per week? That's the labor hours per week. And a backlog of no more than two weeks is required if the full-time employee works 40 hours per week. So as you see here, we have 1,250 divided by, in parentheses, two weeks times 40 hours per week per employee. And that will give you 15.625 which means you will need 16 employees. So you need, so your crew size needs to be uh, 16 uh, persons. Let's look at uh, computerized maintenance management systems, CMMS. So uh, <coughs> these basically are uh, software-based. Computerized maintenance management systems are software-based and they do functions such as employee statistical methods and techniques. Uh, determine locations of resources, like for example, uh, the staff size and uh, planning and other uh, uh, um, resources based on computer simulations. The track and control uh, the backlog. The track and updating equipment history. It's actually really, really important, by the way. Uh, using the software can help significantly. So, uh, for example, here, when a maintenance task is performed on an equipment, it is documented in a software package. Like, for example, if you have, for instance, let's say, uh, for example, uh, if you have a milling machine, for instance, and uh, uh, every time, uh, you know, it fails, you can actually document that in a software. If you, if it, for example, stops working, you can just open the software and see when was the last time it, it underwent uh, preventive maintenance. Or when was, what was the last thing that was changed, uh, replaced in the, in the equipment. Uh, what is the thing that uh, keeps failing more over and over? So it will give you a lot of information to pinpoint uh, the problem. So it's really helpful. Uh, an example of uh, maintenance software is the N4EAM, for example. You can look at it on uh, YouTube at this uh, link provided here. Total Productive Maintenance, TPM. So this here, it's a strategy, Total uh, Productive Maintenance, TPM. That was developed in Japan. So, like I said, actually, uh, it's it's one of the let's say uh, lean manufacturing uh, um, uh, sub strategies. You know, uh, it's uh, basically uh, <coughs> this here TPM. There are actually three uh, features for it. Number one, it's uh, this is what is unique about uh, TPM. So, uh, number one, so it views maintenance as a profitable part of business. And, non, and not a non-profit activity. It's very important. So maintenance actually generates, you can uh, look at it as a, as a business that generates income for you. Okay? Why? Because it saves you a lot of money. So it is not something that is a non-profit activity. It's something, it's a business that generates money for you. Number two, the second main feature is empowering operators. This is very, very effective and very critical. So uh, uh, operators basically they take ownership of the equipment. 
And like, for example, uh, you know, you can, uh, uh, when they take ownership of the equipment, you know, uh, it becomes a lot more, say, more effective. Like, for example, you would say, oh, that's uh, uh, Mike's milling machine. This is here. Uh, Robert's milling machine is missing something. Uh, Mike's milling machine is uh, clean. Uh, so, so as you see, so it's basically you take ownership of the equipment. Uh, reduce six major losses. We're going to look at them in a minute. Six major losses to be reduced. So this is basically a strategy. So it has so uh, something about this uh, strategy is that it has uh, clear cut goals. Okay, uh, there's nothing vague in it. It's just uh, simple but clear cut uh, uh, goals and objectives. Uh, this is actually, like I said, this is the main feature of lean manufacturing, like 5S, for example. It's something uh, very simple, but it has uh, it's very clearly uh, very clear objectives that can be implemented. So. Uh, uh, now let's look at the second feature, which is uh, empowering our operators. Let's look at the responsibilities of the operators. Housekeeping and organization to keep things organized and clean. Equipment cleaning. Protecting uh, machines from dirt, like covering them when needed. If there's, for example, uh, something nearby that may uh, generate dirt, you know, uh, you can, uh, the, the operator actually covers the machine to protect it. Uh, lubrication. Routine inspection. Uh, look for loose parts or vibration or uh, any uh, unrecognized noise. So these things only the operator actually knows them. Uh, if there is a change in the noise or if there is some weird vibration. Uh, so that's why actually the operator level is very very important in maintenance. And routine adjustments. Actually let's say uh, <coughs> Siemens Technic Academy actually. Uh, they came up actually with a new term by the way. It's called uh, the will grounded operator okay a well-grounded operator that's that operator in addition of, to these responsibilities the well-grounded operator can do uh, troubleshooting can do uh, let's say uh, certain types of troubleshooting or let's say simple to medium level uh, troubleshooting uh, on the equipment so this becomes overall this becomes more effective uh, uh, more productive to the to the plant So uh, now let's go to the, to the third feature here, which is uh, the six major losses of uh, TPM to reduce to reduce the six major losses. So equipment failure losses uh, or losses that that come from uh, failure of the equipment. Setup and routine adjustment losses. These are, that are a result of adjustment on the on the routines and the setup. Idling and minor stoppage uh, uh, losses. Reduced speed losses, if let's say reduced speed below the optimized speed. Defects and rework losses, uh, this is also very important. Like for example, uh, let's say uh, Robert's production line uh, have 5% uh, uh, defects, but uh, for example, uh, Larry's production line has 2% uh, uh, defects. So uh, <coughs> reducing the defects is actually a, a very important thing also. Uh, startup uh, uh, losses. You know, uh, for startup loss that that come from uh, the startup time. So uh, again, so maintenance. The target of maintenance is to increase uptime and reduce downtime. So uh, uptime, the time the equipment is running. Downtime, the time the equipment is down and not running. Okay. Types of maintenance activities. So there's three. Uh, uh, maintenance activities there's preventive maintenance or preventative maintenance also called predictive maintenance and corrective maintenance so uh, preventive maintenance performing scheduled and unscheduled tasks and equipment for optimization and preventing failure so it's uh, really the routines it's the the p the uh, so preventive maintenance pm it's the pm routines that take place like for mostly for example say uh, checking loose uh, 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 wires you know and so it's preventive maintenance uh, predictive maintenance condition monitoring of any equipment in comparison to a pre, uh, preset standard or baseline so pre predictive maintenance is based on scientific collecting scientific data okay so predictive maintenance you, you have to collect scientific data like for example you can uh, for example the oil you can look at the oil for instance and uh, check the color of the oil if there's too much oxidization in it or not 
this is collecting uh, this is based on evidence uh, scientific evidence okay then based on that you can say well this needs to be changed uh, for example also collecting let's say uh, vibration vibration analysis uh, also so there's actually different techniques that can be used and we're going to look at them later for predictive maintenance but the idea here is that predictive maintenance is based on collecting scientific data okay scientific evidence that there's going to be uh, soon there's going to be a failure taking place okay finally there is corrective or reactive maintenance so this here after a failure takes place after a failure occurs you are going to correct for that failure or it's actually a reactive to that failure so that it's called corrective or reactive maintenance so performing the maintenance after a part failure the most expensive type this is the most expensive type of maintenance okay so uh, let's take this example it's actually a good example so uh, for instance let's say we have a light bulb okay the light bulb has a lifespan of three years for example so uh, preventive maintenance is to replace the light bulb with a new one uh, just before the three years pass okay like let's say at two uh, and a half years you replace uh, the light bulb even if it's st still working even if the light bulb still uh, is still working fine you're, you replace it because you can expect that it's like it's it's at the end of its uh, lifespan predictive maintenance that's when you leave the light bulb until it starts flickering okay like for example fl flickers for example uh, when you turn it on or every few minutes okay then uh, that flickering will tell you that the light bulb is gonna fail soon so when that happens and you change it uh, that's you are doing predictive maintenance corrective maintenance so this is when you wait for the light bulb to one day you come and you turn it on and it's not it's not turning on okay uh, so that's corrective maintenance the operator ignores the flickering bulb and only replaces the light bulb when the correct when the current one fails so uh, let's look at the importance of uh, preventive maintenance so uh, preventive maintenance like I told like I said before it's uh, you have to look at it as a business okay as a business that is profitable it gives you profit and not only as a non-profit uh, uh, task so preventive maintenance and significance of cost savings that result from implementing it can be viewed in the case study in the book so uh, there's a case study of uh, of a crash of uh, flight uh, 261 uh, in the book it's actually good it will show you how uh, basically uh, uh, if actually preventive maintenance was done on the flight uh, it would have saved it and saved millions of dollars okay we're gonna see actually a table actually uh, at the end of this uh, uh, lesson uh, that will show you different uh, in the aviation industry uh, different uh, the number of uh, crashes that occurred as a result of maintenance or lack of maintenance so uh, predictive maintenance we're gonna look at predictive maintenance later but just to give you an idea of what is predictive maintenance some activities include vibration analysis okay so vibration analysis uh, basically uh, you analyze uh, the motion in a mechanical system uh, really the here uh, actually uh, every let's say every mechanical structure not only mechanical all the structures actually like for example a bridge a building any structure will have uh, a natural uh, frequency okay everything has a natural frequency and uh, what happens is that if there is a crack in the structure the natural frequency will deviate it will change slightly okay so you can actually predict before a failure happens uh, from the deviation of the frequency uh, that there is a crack or there is uh, something happening something wrong with the system okay so uh, a change in, in the natural frequency of the structure can indicate a fracture in a shaft or a slight misalignment in a pulley uh, I can give an example actually on that is for instance uh, bridges by the way most uh, most structures will have their uh, natural frequency in the range of let's say one to three Hertz okay one to three Hertz like for example uh, uh, bridges so uh, you know for example a bridge actually uh, most bridges will have uh, their, their natural frequency in that range one to two Hertz uh, that's the same uh, frequency when uh, soldiers march 
when there's an army that is marching, uh, you know, it will have uh, in that, uh, frequency in that range. So uh, what happens is that in the past, when armies actually march over bridges, what happens is that uh, it matches with if you actually if the frequency matches with the natural frequency of the bridge, what's going to happen? It's going to start vibrating. Okay, it's going to start vibrating, uh, you know, violently, and sometimes it will actually, you know, uh, collapse. So for that reason, you know, they actually uh, uh, they learned that uh, when they reach bridges, they should not march, but they should uh, just walk uh, randomly. Okay. So this is just an example to give you uh, how structures have a natural frequency and uh, the natural frequency uh, is going to be in the same range as uh, marching like like I said one two two four three Hertz uh, uh, frequency so uh, vibration analysis oil analysis like to investigate the color the physical properties of the uh, of the oil there's for, for example uh, metal uh, contamination or so on uh, thermography uh, the temperature of an equipment at different operating conditions. So these are just uh, some examples. There's also more, and we're going to see that in more detail uh, later. The 10 safety rules. This is very important and very critical to remember. Uh, so safety is really the most important thing. So uh, I mentioned that in previous class, but I'm going to mention it also here. So uh, the 10 safety rules. You have to wear safety glasses all the time. Okay, safety glasses must be worn in the lab all the time. Uh, there's no excuse to uh, uh, remove safety glasses. Even if you're not working on anything, as long as you are in the lab, you must wear your safety glasses. Uh, rule number, number two, remove watches, jewelry, rings, and ties. So anything, for example, that can be tangled in uh, moving, uh, you know, uh, machinery like for example that's how you cannot you have to take it off okay if you have a long hair you must tie it up or put it in a cap uh, wear tight fitted clothes and remove uh, uh, jackets wear short sleeves or properly rolled up uh, long sleeves wear heavy duty shoes so uh, please in the lab never come wearing flip flops or any uh, open toe uh, shoes uh, make sure the floor is dry before you start and stays dry during the uh, lab session. So uh, this is very also very important. Never start your lab session if the floor is wet or greasy. Familiarize yourself with the location of the emergency stop buttons before you start your lab session. Of course, this not only applies to the labs, it also applies to an industrial setting. Okay, In an industrial setting, also you have to follow these rules. Uh, some labs uh, may require wearing electrically installed. So here, this course actually, you know, you're not, you're not gonna get uh, into uh, a situation where you have to wear electrically installed. But like I said, in an industrial setting, you have to uh, follow uh, these rules. Inform other students around you and your group members if you are working in a group. This is very important. Before you turn on any machinery or any equipment, you have to make sure that everyone around you is aware that you're gonna uh, turn it on. Okay. So, let's look at some safety procedures, critical safety procedures. And uh, the main one of them is the lockout, tagout uh, standard. So, uh, this was uh, this actually took effect in 1989 in the U.S. It's basically to control hazardous energy uh, sources. So, there's actually two parts in it, or two devices. The lockout is uh, the placement of a device that locks out the energy isolating uh, uh, that, that isolates the energy. Okay, uh, tag out is a placement of a tag out on the energy isolating device that states that there is a danger if you remove it. Okay, so uh, these are the two parts: like out and tag out. Some re these are just some of the requirements. Some of the requirements you have to use a positive means to keep the energy isolating uh, uh, device in the safe position. So uh, you have to. Uh, use a positive means, otherwise you have to add something, like a, for example a lock. But you cannot remove a wire. Okay, so if you remove a wire, it's not considered a, a lockout. You have to add a lock or you have to, uh, like I said, a positive, use a positive means. The lockout device must be able to withstand the environment it's exposed to, such as for example excessive heat, radiation, and freezing, and so on. The lockout and tagout devices must be standardized in the facility in size and color and shape. The lockout device must be strong enough to prevent removal without excessive force. 
notification of uh, employees before the application and after removal of the uh, lockout tagout. Very important to notify everyone. Only the employee who applied it can remove the lockout. This is very, very critical. Only the person who put it can remove it. Okay? Only the person who put the lockout can remove the uh, lockout. No one else. Tag out requirements. So it has to include a clear warning, like for example, the word warning itself or the word danger. Okay? It must state clearly that moving the energy isolating device from the safe mode is not allowed. It must be placed. Uh, in the place uh, a lock device uh, would be placed, or if not possible, as close as, uh, as safely possible in a position obvious to anyone who attempts to operate the device. So it has to be near the lock, uh, the lock or uh, somewhere uh, close to it as possible. It must be able to withstand the environment and be standardized, and it must have a non-reusable type of attachment. Okay, non-reusable. So uh, before we go to the questions let's uh, we're gonna see do some activities one of them uh, like I said if you remember we said the uh, one of the main tasks of a level one technician is reading uh, calipers okay reading uh, um, equipment uh, instruments so uh, when you read a caliper a vernier caliper for example or a dial caliper most likely nowadays we're gonna just encounter uh, dial calipers or there's also micrometers okay a micrometer is the, these are, all of these are uh, precision devices, okay? High precision uh, reading instruments. Uh, the micrometer is very high precision. It's, it's actually higher than the caliper, okay? So, uh, for example, if you have a, uh, a vernier caliper, so there's actually two readings that you should, should take. There's the main scale reading and there's the vernier scale reading. The final reading is going to be the, the, the addition of the two the main scale reading and add it to it, the vernier scale reading. So uh, <clears throat> how to do that? When you open it and uh, uh, the caliper, uh, you're gonna actually look at the the marks on the main and the, the vernier reading uh, scales until you see the first two uh, marks that align. Okay, the first alignment of the main and the vernier uh, marks that will be the vernier reading okay like for instance here if you look at this picture here for example so when you open it here as you see it has stopped so uh, if you look at it here so we have this is in centimeters so here we have one two and if you count here one two three four and it's between the four and the five okay so it's uh, it's uh, two centimeters and four millimeters and there's gonna be uh, 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 between uh, the four and the five millimeters. Okay. Now to determine how much is that, you have to look at the uh, the vernier scale. So the vernier scale over here, uh, as you see here, we're gonna look for the first uh, mark that aligns with the main scale. So the first mark, if you look at it here, is gonna be around, let's say. around okay well around seven okay or uh, yeah actually here here i think this here or here okay so so yeah I don't, this actually this here is the first alignment as you see so this is where it aligns so that's going to give you as you see here by the way so this is one millimeter is divided into 20 uh so as you see here this is here is the divisions of the one millimeter okay so as you see here we have 20 uh, divisions 20 divisions so here we are at seven exactly seven so that's gonna be uh, um, uh, uh, this here is seven and a half this is seven okay so it's gonna be seven uh, uh, um, that's seven hundredth of the centimeter okay seven hundredth of the centimeter so in other words uh, 0.7 uh, millimeter so in total it's gonna be two, uh, so it's gonna be 24 millimeters plus uh, uh, is uh, 0.7 so that's going to be 24.7 millimeters or 2.47 centimeters so these are uh, a vernier caliper like i said uh, now a dial caliper you're going to read it directly from the dial okay there's also a micrometer a very high precision uh, device let's do these uh, questions so uh, 
the time when a machine or equipment is not functioning is called so when it's not functioning that's going to be the downtime of the equipment which statement is correct of the following so you have to read all the statements and then determine which one is correct only the lockout device is required to withstand the environment in which it is to be placed that's false because both have to be uh, have to withstand the environment only the tag out that's also false either one that's false both lockout and tag out devices must be able to withstand the environment so this is the correct answer mark each statement below in regards to lockout tag out as true or false when performing a lockout tag out procedure the tag out, the tag out device must contain a clear warning such as danger on it this is true okay a lockout device is acceptable as long as a child below the age of 12 is not able to remove it that's false an affected employee affected employee can remove the lockout the lockout and tag out device Device once maintenance work is done, provided that the affected employee is a full-time managerial level employee in the department in which the lockout tagout was applied. Is that true or false? That's going to be false. Okay, only the person who applied it can remove it. The lockout device uh, must use a positive means such as a mechanical lock to keep the energy isolating device in the safe position. This is true. You must use a positive means. The protection provided by the tagout device is enough and eliminates the necessity of a lockout device this is false so you need to have both the uh, lockout and the tagout this exercise this is a picture of uh, two students and the question is what is what safety violation is there okay, there's a safety violation in this picture what is it and we discuss we're going to discuss this in the class uh, basically, as you see here, the safety violation is the hair. So the hair needs to be uh, uh, tied up. Okay. Now, understanding a mechatronic system with blocks and energy flow diagram. So, like I said, uh, so uh, um, the first step when you maintain, when you actually are troubleshooting an equipment in the troubleshooting process, the first thing you need to do is you need to know how does it work. Okay, you cannot uh, troubleshoot something that you never saw it working. Okay, so you need to see the equipment running, or you need to at least know how it works. Like for example, if it's a TV, okay, we know everyone knows how a TV works. Okay, uh, if it was a system, then you need uh, 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 a manufacturing system. Then you need to see the manufacturing system running. Okay, you need to know how does it work. This is the first step. The second step, when you start uh, 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 troubleshooting, you need to or to make it simpler to your, for yourself is to uh, understand how the modules are connected okay in other words understand the energy flow diagram so the energy, energy flow diagram basically will tell you how what is going on okay the work piece is coming from here and leaving from there for example or the work piece is coming from here it's gonna go up there and uh, and uh, then it's gonna get stamped and then come down and deep. so you need to know how does the flow how is the flow going in the system okay how's the process going you need to understand the different modules okay so this is the first step then after that you can look into each module in the individually to get more details okay so we're gonna mo modulize the system okay like for example here let's look at this uh, here this uh, station here it's a gauging station one of the mechatronics uh, trainers so uh, let's look at the components here so for example here this here is the pressure regulator um these here for instance are solenoid valves these here are contactors okay uh, contactors like uh, relays uh, if you notice here they're actually mechanically interlocked there are two contactors mechanically interlocked and if you remember from previous courses uh, when you have two contactors mechanically interlocked then most likely they're used for forward reverse control right this here is a motor it's actually particularly a dc motor and here this is a clutch okay a slip clutch the slip clutch is supposed to, to protect the motor from overloads okay this here for example is a ball screw all right and so on so these are basically the modules uh, on the station so the first thing is to uh, you need to uh, know how, the, how it works you need to see it working and you need to understand the modules and the connections and the flow uh, uh, process uh, of the of the energy in the in the process so what we're going to do 
of course you need to see it uh, running like i said it's very critical that you see uh, 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 the machine or the process running so that you know and you so you know and you expect what uh, uh, what is going to be how it should be okay so it's very important uh, the first task that we're going to do in the lab uh, is basically uh, the energy flow diagrams so in that task when we go to the lab i'm gonna uh, ask you to divide into uh, groups and each group is gonna take a station and you need to first identify the different modules okay identify modules and uh, run it understand how does it function how do they relate to each other okay whereas for example the material flow for instance uh, there's actually three things that you need to have so there's uh, uh, the material flow that's the work piece for example the pallets how does it go where does it come from and where does it, does it exit okay uh, the electrical the energy flow whether electrical or me or, or uh, uh, pneumatic or mechanical or different uh, types of energy how does it flow okay and number three the data flow the data flow basically how is what is going to be collecting data the sensors okay uh, the actuators uh, the solenoids and so on uh, that receive the data signals and of course the, the controller whether it's a plc or a computer and uh, in addition to the uh, like i said the energy and the uh, the material flow so after we do that and we understand the system after that we can start doing the uh, troubleshooting finally i want to close with this uh, graph here from the book it will show you over four years from 1995 to 1998 different aviation accidents that uh, were primarily uh, involving uh, maintenance as the cause okay so let's look at it here so in 1995 there was 150 accidents it increased slightly in 1996 but then it started decreasing so uh, you can see here that so we had 150 per year uh, 150 here 149 130 so so uh, it's actually a large number that's only the, in the aviation industry uh, that involves so we can see now the effect and uh, the criticality of uh, maintenance for uh, systems well thank you and uh, if you have any questions please email me or uh, let me know thanks